1990, Dick Tracy leapt onto the big screen in a blaze of comic book action, along with a blaze of colour, making this one of the most colourful crime gangster movies ever made. Hollywood icon Warren Beatty plays Dick Tracy, the tough, no-nonsense 1930s detective who is on a mission to take down a criminal gangster syndicate led by Big Boy Caprice, played with joyful cartoon menace by Al Pacino, where Tracy teams up with sidekick street orphan called Kid, where he rages a cat and mouse war against the crime that wrecks havoc in the city. In 1990, Dick Tracy was everywhere, and I mean everywhere. In its time, this thing was huge. Story and action-wise, there wasn't anything really spectacular about it. So why is it that back in 1990, we just couldn't get enough of Dick Tracy and his love for the colour yellow? Well, I have two theories. One is that after the hype of Tim Burton's Batman movie, audiences were hungry for the next comic book adventure movie. And two, Madonna. By 1990, Madonna was a hugely popular star and having her attached to the movie definitely gave it that extra kick and gravitas and star-powered attention. But regardless, the movie is very visually appealing, and for lack of a better word, it looks beautiful and stunning, which does make Dick Tracy an appeasing experience on a visual level, and it also features an array of celebrity appearances along with mobster characters who look grotesque with exaggerated features, like they have just literally stepped out of a comic book. In fact, when I was a kid, the one thing that appealed to me the most about Dick Tracy was the creepy looking makeup that was used in the movie. I thought the villains of the movie looked so cool and monstrous, it was that that instantly had me hooked. I think to some, the Dick Tracy movie is celebrated, whereas to others it's a bit hit and miss. So today we are going to celebrate the good and bad by looking into 10 things that you may not know about Dick Tracy. Do this, let's! Whose side are you on? The side I'm always on. Mine. Number 10. The Long History of Dick Tracy. Because the 1990 movie is such a prominent piece of pop culture in its own right, I think that people tend to overlook Dick Tracy's long and expansive career, as Dick Tracy first started as a comic strip character who was first published in 1931, yep, making him seven years older than Superman. The strip captured the popular cops and robbers mood at the time and proved popular. Dick Tracy would go on to evolve and get his own radio show, along with featuring in his own comic books, where he then got a string of movie serials and feature movies, starting from 1937 and lasting all the way to 1947, with an actor called Ralph Bird taking on the Dick Tracy mantle. Among these movies and serials was Dick Tracy Meets Gruesome, which featured horror movie monster legend Boris Karloff as the main villain. Dick Tracy continued his break into different formats in 1961 with a Dick Tracy animated series and an unsuccessful TV pilot in 1967. But as time went on and the superhero craze became more prominent, Dick Tracy was starting to get left behind and was more and more losing his public recognition. So a new updated theatrical movie was well and truly long overdue. Which leads me to the early days of the movie's production. Number 9, Dick Tracy's timely pre-production. It was as early as 1975 when actor Warren Beatty wanted to make a modern movie version about the world's greatest comic strip detective. But at that stage, Dick Tracy was kind of in ownership lingo, being passed on from one holder to another. Finally, in 1980, the ball started to get rolling as Paramount Pictures started to show interest and a script started to get developed. On board to write was Tom Mankiewicz, who had previously written some James Bond movies and the first two Christopher Reeve Superman movies. 
Steven Spielberg was offered to direct, but he turned it down. John Landis was then brought on board, and he was negotiating with Clint Eastwood for starring as Dick Tracy. However, Landis left the project after the fatal onset tragedy while he was making the Twilight Zone movie. And then the project basically collapsed. Beatty then decided to finance the film himself. And the project then left Paramount and went to Walt Disney Studios. Martin Scorsese was brought on board to direct the film, but he left the project to make Goodfellas instead. Beatty then put forward to Disney that he should direct the movie, which would have placed him as the movie's director, producer, and main star. And Disney eventually agreed. And finally, the movie was greenlit in 1988. Ugh! Which basically means the movie took 15 years to make. <sighs> Number 8. Cast Possibilities So while Dick Tracy was in the hands of Paramount Pictures, there were many potential actors suggested to take on the yellow coat and fedora. As mentioned, when John Landis was the movie's director, Clint Eastwood was on board to star as Tracy. But before Warren Beatty cast himself in the role, other potential Dick Tracy candidates included Tom Selleck, Harrison Ford, Mel Gibson, and Richard Gere. I think Warren Beatty was the right man for the job, as he seems to have a love for the source material and understands the character. Madonna lobbied for herself to star in the movie as Breathless Mahoney. Originally, the studios were looking at Kim Basinger or Kathleen Turner to star in the part, but they ended up going with Madonna. I guess it didn't hurt that she was going out with Beatty at the time. Macaulay Culkin was offered the role of Kid, but he decided to star in Home Alone instead. Sean Young was originally cast as Tess Trueheart, but ended up getting fired after a supposed falling out with Warren Beatty. So the part went to Glenn Headley instead. Wow, poor Sean Young didn't have the best of luck in the late 80s and early 90s, as she was also originally cast as Vicky Vale for Tim Burton's Batman, but had to leave that project due to an injury. And Gene Hackman was approached for a cameo, but he turned it down. Number 7. Warren Beatty's Failed Makeup Prosthetics As I already mentioned, for me personally, one of the most delightful aspects of the Dick Tracy movie was the weird and grotesque makeup worn by the movie's villains, making them look more like caricature of gangsters, which went with the movie's comic strip vibe. However, originally BT wanted his Dick Tracy look to resemble the original comic strips. What with Dick Tracy's strong brick-like jawline and square nose. Tracy in the movie was going to be just like the villains and have prosthetic makeup in his face to give him exaggerated features. In this case, a jawline and nose. But the test just didn't look right, and it was felt that Tracy would have been alienating, which was probably not a good idea to have the hero of your movie to be alienating, so it was decided to use BT's face as is. Speaking of makeup tests, as you can see here, it took a lot of trial and error to accomplish Al Pacino's big boy look. Number 6. A Lend in Hand from Roger Rabbit Just two years prior to Dick Tracy, the hit movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit came out and was a massive success and huge breadwinner for Disney. So considering that Roger Rabbit was still fairly new and that Dick Tracy was Disney's next big franchise hit to come out after Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it was decided to start the movie off with a Roger Rabbit short cartoon when the movie was shown in theatres. Ironically, that very year, Gremlins 2 came out, which started with a Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck short, which makes you wonder if these studios knew what the other was doing and was trying to outdo the other one. The short cartoon that was used was called Roller Coaster Rabbit, and would see the return of voice actors Child Fleischer and Kathleen Turner as Roger and Jessica Rabbit. And personally, I think having a cartoon that's meant to feel like it's from the 1930s be shown before a movie which is actually set in the 1930s, which also has a comic book look and feel to it, just makes the two gel together. However, not all were happy. Steven Spielberg, who owned half the Roger Rabbit rights, wanted Roller Coaster Rabbit to be shown at the start of Arachnophobia, which he produced, but Disney chose to screen it with Dick Tracy instead, which caused him to cancel another Roger Rabbit short that he was working on called Hair in My Soup. Ah, uh, look, I love Steven Spielberg and all, but seriously, what a spoil sport. 
Number five, from the sounds of Batman to Dick Tracy. So seeing how Dick Tracy was coming in off the success of Tim Burton's Batman, it made sense for Disney to hire Batman's composer Danny Elfman to score the movie. And I love Elfman's score that he provides for Dick Tracy. It has that distinct dark comic book sound that he used for Batman, but it also manages to be its own thing at the same time. I always thought the Dick Tracy theme sounded like it could have been the Batman theme's twin. Similar, yet different, but still awesome. In fact, 1990 was without a doubt Danny Elfman's year, as that very year he also provided the scores for Darkman and Edward Scissorhands, of which I believe the music in that to be his greatest masterpiece. And not forgetting of course that year he provided the score for the Flash TV series. Once again, brilliant music which pays homage to Batman, but at the same time also being its own thing. Number 4, Action Figures. If you were a kid in 1990, then you would be able to relate to the massive demand to get your hands on some Dick Tracy action figures. Yep, us kids were raiding the toy stores in droves, so we could create our own fun, exciting Dick Tracy adventures. The figures were kind of hit and miss for me. It disappointed me that Dick Tracy didn't have his distinct yellow coat. I felt that he needed that coat, otherwise he's just a guy wearing a yellow hat. Also, the figures were released by Playmates, who also brought out the impossibly popular Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles action figures. And oddly, the Dick Tracy figures used the same body structure as the Ninja Turtle ones, which meant, like the Ninja Turtles, they have legs that are really separated and far apart, with oval-shaped bodies along with big chunky arms. Although the design worked for the Ninja Turtles, as they were turtles, it didn't work so much in human format as it makes them look cartoonish. Still, the colours were pretty vibrant. I always wanted an action figurine of Al Pacino. Personally, I would have rather a Scarface action figurine, but I suppose in the meantime, Big Boy from Dick Tracy will have to do. Number three, video game. So considering how Dick Tracy was everywhere in 1990, I guess it was inevitable that he would eventually show up on the Nintendo Entertainment System. In the Dick Tracy video game, where you play as Tracy, and it feels much more like a thinking detective game, kind of like Where is Carmen San Diego, where you have to go from location to location and get clues and solve crimes. But the problem is, this isn't what Nintendo was about. Nintendo wasn't about time-consuming detective work, it was about action and adventure. There are some levels that act like side-scrollers where you get to walk around as Dick Tracy and punch bad guys, but they are very few and far between for my taste. And of course, there's the awkward control steering of Dick Tracy's car, something that is awful on legendary levels. Something so terrible, it no doubt gave gamers nervous breakdowns. Basically, the driving stages made the game unplayable. A video game on Dick Tracy could have been awesome, but this feels like a missed opportunity. Number 2. MTV's Strange Dick Tracy Competition So thanks to the star power of Madonna, not only did Dick Tracy appeal to kids, but it also appealed to teenagers as well. And MTV tried to get in on this market by unleashing a truly bizarre competition called the Be Dick Tracy Contest, where you would call this hotline number and the winner gets a yellow Dick Tracy coat and fedora and attends a Dick Tracy premiere party at MGM Studios and go on to some Dick Tracy styled missions to uncover $15,000. The ad alone is weird as it starts off with a young couple having a picnic in which the boyfriend is so into reading his Dick Tracy comic that he starts to act out as if it was real. Gary, it's time we had a serious talk. You're gonna have to kill me first, flat top. This guy has problems. Where he then gets sucked into the comic and is nearly killed by one of the gangsters only to be told that he can't become Dick Tracy just by wishing it. Kid, you can't be Dick Tracy by wishing it. Yeah! You can't become Dick Tracy by wishing it! You have to call MTV's hotline first! 
Call rates at $2.99 per minute. After the first 20 seconds, charges and fees apply. Number one, the movie was nearly followed by a TV series. During the 90s, Bruce Campbell was trying to get a live-action Dick Tracy TV show off the ground, which sounds absolutely perfect to me. After all, he definitely had the chin for the role, and I can imagine him injecting his unusual infectious humour into the part. In order for the TV show to get made, it had one big obstacle, Warren Beatty, who owned the rights to Dick Tracy and had no interest in making the TV show. So the Bruce Campbell Dick Tracy TV series was scrapped. In fact, Beatty still owns the rights to Dick Tracy and doesn't seem to be doing anything with it anytime soon. In 2008, his ownership of the character was about to expire unless he produced some product, where he appeared in character as Dick Tracy and took part in a TV interview. Hmm, I guess in 2008 we were so caught up in the return of Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones, we completely overlooked Warren Beatty's return as Dick Tracy. So that was my look into Dick Tracy. Yeah, the movie is flawed, and even though the hype was massive in 1990, it was very short-lived, and then came along 1991 with Terminator 2. So the big question is, is Dick Tracy a good movie, or a bad movie? Well, to me, it just is. Things happen, they show up on the screen, the movie just plays out. Things happen on screen, the bad guys do things, Dick Tracy sets out to stop them, and then the movie just ends. So, yeah, the movie is neither good or bad, it just happens. But one thing the movie is, is visually stunning. It's a very visually appeasing movie. And that alone makes it worthwhile watching. It's basically eye candy, but eye candy of the highest order. Anyway, I'm Minty, and look out for my Be Minty for a Day competition, where contestants get to be me for a day and clean my house and pay my bills. That's, that's just a joke, by the way. That's just a joke. All right, see ya.